webinar. And we are live and we are recording. So we will have people joining us. Welcome, everyone. We are just getting started and um, broadcasting this live on Facebook as well. So Julia, whenever you're ready, you can take over. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Julia Felgner, a special projects assistant for the National Trust for Canada, uh, coming to you from Ottawa, Ontario. Welcome to the fifth event for the launch day of Canada Historic Places Days. Before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge that I'm currently situated on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Today, Lauren and Madeline from Lane Pioneer Village Museum will be joining us from Peterborough, Ontario for a showing of a pre-recorded video that explores both the indigenous and settler local history that has shaped and impacted the lives of many people today. After the video, we invite you to stay for a quick Q&A session to discuss any questions you have about Lang and the content covered in the presentation. For those of you who are just joining us for Historic Places Days, this nationwide month-long event from July 3rd to July 31st invites Canadians to experience more than 400 historic sites coast to coast, virtually or in person, depending on each region's social distancing guidelines and each site specific situation. The program encourages Canadians to engage with, learn from, and support local historic places while reflecting on the history of our country. Today, we have even more virtual events after this one, so if you're interested, please check out our website at historicplacesdays.ca and sign up on our launch date uh, 2021 page. We also have a virtual selfie contest that you can participate in for a chance to win $1,000 for yourself, as well as $1,000 for the historic place in your photo, and a visit list contest where you can create a list of all the historic places you'd like to visit or have visited for a chance to win one of 15 $500 via vouchers. Again, you can check out the details on our website. I would now like to hand it over to Lauren and Madeline, who will begin the presentation from Lane Pioneer Village Museum. Hello, Julia, and everybody watching us today. Thank you so much for having us. I think we're going to get started in one or two minutes, but until then, we invite you to share where you're joining us from today and whose traditional lands you're joining us from today. Um, if that's not something you know, we encourage you to look it up. I will put in the chat now a link to a website where you can find the traditional territories of the land that you are situated on so that you can share that with us in the chat. I managed to pull the classic Zoom, I'm on mute, but I'm talking anyway. So hello and welcome everyone to today's event, a Bognuman looking forward. Before we, would be, uh, before we begin, I'd like to share that if you're joining us for, via Zoom, we do have our live captioning feature enabled um, and you're welcome to start the captioning for this meeting. So welcome again to everyone joining us virtually at Lang Pioneer Village for our Canada Historic Places Days launch event. You may have noticed that people have been sharing with us where they're joining us from today in the chat and acknowledging whose traditional lands they're on. We invite you to continue to do so throughout the presentation if you're just joining us now. My name is Lauren Stoyles. I'm a historical interpreter at Lang Pioneer Village Museum and I will be your host for today's event. I'm joined in this role by Madeline Duncan from Curve Lake First Nation, the interpreter of Indigenous history at the museum. We would like to begin today's event with a land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that Lang Pioneer Village Museum is located on the Treaty 20 Michisaugig territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisaugig and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the William Treaty's First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and Georgina Island First Nations. 
Lang Pioneer Village Museum respectfully acknowledges that the William Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. As we participate in Canada Historic Places Days this year, visit historic sites and museums, be it virtually or in person, and talk about the history of the land that we now know as Canada, it's important that we reflect on the entirety of this history. We encourage you throughout this event and in your daily life beyond it to consider the aspects of Canadian history that are often forgotten or intentionally left out of the picture, in addition to the stories of resilience, determination, and strength that have been at the center of our historical narratives. For today's event, we'll be sharing with you a Bogdman, Looking Forward, a pre-recorded video that tells the story of Noga Jingwenong, now, known, now known sorry, as Peterborough County, beginning in the 1800s and extending into the present. This storied tour explores both Indigenous and settler local history, which has shaped the lives of many people today. These stories form the basis of the living history that visitors experience when visiting Lang Pioneer Village in Keene, Ontario. I will note that this video contains brief discussions of residential schools, forced displacement, and the disenfranchisement of Indigenous communities. If you are not in a space to hear about these events, please feel free to click out of this event at any time. Your well being is important. We will put links to the Indian Residential School Survivor Society website, Hope for Wellness website, and the CMHA resources page in the chat. We encourage you to reach out if you are struggling. After we show our video today, we will invite participants to join us in a Q&A period. Your questions are welcome through Facebook chat, through the Q&A feature, or the chat function on Zoom. Um, and we'll invite you to submit your questions in any format that is the most accessible to you. Now, just give me a second. Hopefully, our tech holds out this time. Um, and I will share with you a Bogdman looking forward. Our story begins in the 1820s in Nagujiwanong, now known as Peterborough County. Long before Europeans were surveying the area and clearing it for agriculture, it was the traditional hunting and fishing grounds of the Michisaugig and Anishinaabeg. Relationships between the Michisaugig and other First Nations were often negotiated through treaties. This form of diplomacy continued to be used as early Europeans and First Nations negotiated where and how settlers could use the land. The Royal Proclamation of 1763, a treaty initiated by the British Crown, stated that lands west of established colonies would remain indigenous grounds and were off limits to settlement. These areas could only be acquired through treaties between the Crown and indigenous peoples. Treaty 20, also known as the Rice Lake Purchase, was signed at present-day Port Hope in 1818. It enabled the settlement of over 1 million acres, including Peterborough County. In exchange, the government was supposed to pay in goods to every man, woman, and child, about $9 per person at this time. These were listed as two blankets, cloth for one coat, one pair of trousers, two shirts, several small articles besides a gun, ammunition, kettles, and other items. Prior to colonization in the Peterborough area, the Michisagi would have enjoyed a relatively traditional way of life. In the early 1820s, the Michisagi began adopting an additional spiritual political outlook brought to them by the New England Company and Methodist teachings. The first mission house in Peterborough County was built at Rice Lake, present-day Hiawatha First Nation. This Methodist church would later become Hiawatha United. Later, in the 1820s, an area along the north shore of Rice Lake was officially designated as a reserve under the name of the Mississaugas of Rice Lake Reserve. Twenty-two homes were built near the banks of the lake. A square for public buildings was left in the middle. The village also boasted a store and post office, a schoolhouse, and teacher's residence. 
the Michisaugeeg around Mud Lake settled on a reserve in 1830 in an area now known as Curve Lake First Nation. Prior to colonization, the Michisaugeeg would not have lived in traditional villages. They followed a transient lifestyle, traversing well-developed trails from one camp to the next. A wigwam, or roundhouse, would have been a traditional dwelling constructed from bent saplings and bark from various trees such as birch, cedar, hickory, and basswood, and it would have been designed to accommodate a multi-generational family unit. Monomen, or wild rice, is a sacred food for the Anishinaabeg and was a crucial form of sustenance long before the Trent Severn waterway flooded wetlands used for harvesting the rice. A camp like this might have also included a garden with traditional healing medicines like sweet grass, sage, tobacco, and cedar. One of the ways the Michisagi manipulated the landscape was through planned burning. These controlled burns promoted the growth of their medicines and renewed growth. It would only be a decade before the first residential school, the Mohawk Institute in Branford, was established. Members of the reserves at Mud Lake and Rice Lake began attending the residential schools in the 1840s. Though members were initially interested in sending their children, this soon changed as word spread of strict assimilation and abuse. Meanwhile, impoverished Europeans, including victims of the Irish potato famine, Scottish farmers driven from their lands, and retired British officers, were making the journey across the Atlantic with dreams of a better life. Instead of the idyllic pastures advertised in Europe, settlers were met with untamed wilderness. It wouldn't be until the 1850s that colonization roads would be established, connecting communities through the bush and forever altering the Anishinaabe's traditional hunting grounds and way of life. Early settlers like David and Jane Fife would have had the difficult task of finding their plot, clearing the area, and constructing the small cabin before the winter set in. Round logs were used in haste. Without a sawmill, there was no way to plane the wood, and as it dried, cracks would form, letting in the cold. This would not have been a luxurious life at all. Luckily, the fifes had windows. Most of the time, they would not, due to the difficulty of transporting glass. Food would need to be hung from the ceiling to protect it from mice and bugs. And because the settlers came with only the things they could carry, the few supplies given to them, and their own industriousness, they often relied on the expertise of the local Anishinaabe. When they were able, the Fife family of five would have cooked outside. Not only would cabin fever be an issue in the cramped quarters, the wooden structure itself would have been a fire hazard. Even with these hardships, in just a few decades, the Fife family was beginning to make a name for themselves. In the 1840s, David received a small sample of wheat from a friend in Scotland, having had terrible luck with the varieties common in Canada at the time. Just three heads survived the first planting. According to legend, David's wife, Jane, saved those last three heads of seeds from being eaten by a cow. After careful breeding, David had produced enough seed to share with his neighbors. By the end of the century, red fife weed had become the most common and successful wheat throughout much of North America. The ingenuity of David Fife and his family, along with other settlers in the area, helped forge a thriving farming community, a long way from the rustic homesteads which marked its inception. As the 1800s marched on, European settlers were finding ways to enrich their lives. Self-sustained communities sprouted up along rivers where mills were built. Now settlers could have their wheat processed and sold in larger quantities. While mills became the utilitarian means for success, general stores became essential to the social well-being of communities. 
Essentials, like tea, nails, and flowers, could be bought in bulk, and farmers would take the time to exchange gossip and learn about the latest news. Farm produce, such as eggs and butter, might even be bartered for store goods. The benefits of a prospering community were reflected in the simple conveniences of a traditional home of the time. The Fitzpatrick House would have been a typical settler's second home, a stark improvement from the cramped quarters of the Fife cabin. A large stone hearth sits at the center of the home, providing warmth. Meals would have been prepared over the fire using pots and Dutch ovens. While the house was constructed with more care, temperatures would have dipped below zero in the winter, with no option for heating the upper rooms. Michael and Susan Fitzpatrick would have taken turns sleeping through the night, a practice called segmented sleeping, in order to keep the fire going in complete small chores. Simple luxuries like textiles may have been purchased from local craftsmen or artisans. The S.W. Lowry Weaver Shop is an example of what a local tradesman's store might have looked like. Simple woven fabrics used for blankets, shawls, and rugs would have been constructed on different types of looms, which were operated manually by hand. The creation of the Jacquard loom, which was not available in the region until later in the century, allowed for the execution of more intricate patterns using a set of perforated cards. From this early technology arose modern day computer chips. Besides these few luxuries, the Fitzpatrick family would have made most things needed for daily life. Herbs were dried indoors and used for flavoring and medicines. Before getting married, the girls in the home would have tended to sewing, weaving, and quilt making for the family. It was a tranquil but difficult life. While settlers like the Fitzpatricks had left behind the hardships of early homesteading, their lives were driven by work and meeting their needs. Even so, the successes of Peterborough County farmers were beginning to catch the attention of the British monarchs. In 1860, 18-year-old Albert Edward, Prince of Wales, made the two-week-long journey from England visiting various locations throughout Canada West and the United States. His ship landed in Coburg to a great reception. The leaders of the surrounding Michisaugee communities greeted him with handmade gifts. Apparently, Prince Albert was so taken by the beauty of the area, he named it after Henry Longfellow's poem, The Song of Hiawatha, of which he was quite fond. This was entirely appropriate as Longfellow's poem had been inspired in part by his encounter with Kagigagabo, he who stands forever, who was born in the Michisagi village at Rice Lake, the very location Prince Albert named. These moments of celebration and hard work mark the path towards Confederation. After Confederation, the newly formed Canadian government passed the Gradual Enfranchisement Act in 1869 and later the Indian Act in 1876. While settlers were establishing their lives and becoming more comfortable, the Michisagi were having to adapt to the imposition of these acts along with the introduction of Indian agents. New Western methods of governance were undermining their traditions and politics, an impact still felt today. By the late 1800s, families were beginning to enjoy some of the conveniences of the late Victorian era. The Milburn House is an example of a fixer-upper from the 1870s, at least according to the records left by Thomas and Sarah Milburn's daughter, who would have lived here at the time. Thomas Milburn and his wife Sarah would have added colorful wooden siding, manicured gardens, and a white picket fence, enhancing the curve appeal of their modern home.
Now was the time when Canadians could start thinking about what they wanted and not just what they needed. Seven people would have lived here at one point, and while the room seemed small, they would have been filled with the trappings of a successful household. This parlor would have been saved for special occasions, decorated with a dark, luxurious wallpaper, a horsehair fainting couch, and various pieces of family art. During the 1800s, girls were taught how to be wives. Samplers were one way of instructing young girls on the art of cross-stitch, a kind of guide for future use once she had moved out of her parents' home and into her husband's. Off of the parlor is a room which might have been used as a sick room. Tight quarters meant illness could easily spread through a family. Settlers knew that sick individuals needed to be isolated to contain the spread of germs. Medical treatment was rare, and there were few doctors in the region. Families would either make their own medicines with herbs and plants from their gardens or purchase some from the general store. Medicine was highly unregulated. Opium, also known as laudanum, was often used in the treatment of many ailments. One of the benefits of modern farm life was a cast iron stove. This beautiful big stove would have heated both floors of the Milburn house, along with an additional stove in the parlor. This was the heart of the home, where the family would gather, and again, we see the evidence of a successful farm. Coal oil lamps replaced flickering candles, and a cistern pump provided the convenience of accessing water indoors. Thomas Milburn would have benefited from new farming technologies as well. As yield grew bigger, so did the equipment needed to harvest them. A steam engine, similar to the later Sawyer Massey steam engine model, would have been easily transported through a community to aid in farming endeavors. As the world entered the 20th century, Canadians living in the region were greeted by both great success and difficulty. The Anishinaabeg were faced with some of the greatest challenges. The Williams Treaties, signed in 1923, were meant to clear up previous treaties, including Treaty 20. However, they did not secure hunting and fishing rights for the First Nations involved. This has led to feelings of resentment, mistrust, and a deep sense of loss. However, since the earliest contact, the Michisagig have always advocated for their rights and petitioned the government to honour treaty agreements. Litigation was filed against the government in 1992 for fair compensation. A settlement was only reached in August of 2018 with apologies following in November that year. Indigenous peoples are resilient and their culture, language and spirituality are experiencing a resurgence that is strengthening Indigenous nations and Canada. The past 200 years have been filled with struggles and triumphs. Our current accomplishments and efforts of reconciliation are built on the hard work, advocacy and traditions of our ancestors who live on through us. We can take the best of their natures while learning from their mistakes to effect change for a better world now and for future generations. Thank you very much for joining us and watching Abogden Men. We would like to extend a special thank you to our partners at Curve Lake and Hiawatha First Nations for their support and participation in the creation of this video. 
We also want to thank Impact Communications for the filming and editing of this video. We will now open the virtual floor to questions. Feel free to ask us anything that you're curious about um, regarding local history, settlement, uh, settler indigenous relations or indigenous history. And we will do our best to answer. Um, if we're unable to answer, we'll make sure to pass your questions along or we'll give you the email that you can pass your questions along to yourself if we aren't able to address them today. Uh, we'll give you a few minutes to start putting your questions in the chat and we look forward to seeing them. Madeline, we have a question for you. Um, Sonia is asking, what are you standing in front of? Maybe you'd be able to um, give us a quick tour of the site or yeah. at least explain what's behind you. Am I frozen right now? Um, it's a little choppy, but I think you'll be okay. To around the camera. Um, I think maybe I'll just leave it in one spot. Okay. Can you guys see me? Because I can't see myself, so. We can see you now. The Wi-Fi connection is a little slow. We apologize. We're kind of out in the middle okay. of the country. Go ahead. All right. All right, so I'm sitting in front of the wigwam. So we would have, we saw it in the video and the wigwam is what First Nations people in our area, the Anishinaabe would have lived in. Is Lauren talking? I can't hear her. I'll continue. I'm, you are good to continue. All right. The First Nations people would have lived in the... Okay, sorry about that. The First Nations people would have lived in the wigwam like this. And so the inside of it is made out of a structure of branches and saplings in an arch shape. And then the outside has bark and hide and blankets on it to keep the elements out. And this is something that Indigenous people would have lived in these for all seasons, but they wouldn't have lived in the same wigwam. So um, the Michisagi were nomadic as we oh sorry are we doing all right i can't really hear you are a little bit okay. choppy, sorry but about you that. are okay you so are welcome to we would walk have to... sorry okay you're welcome to walk towards the main building or towards I... the general store Doesn't... hotel we'll give you better connection Okay, I will try going towards the main building. And then in the meantime, maybe we can start on a different question. Okay, thank you, Madeline. And thank you everyone for your patience. We know um, this is definitely the year of tech, tech concerns. Um, so feel free to uh, continue to give us your questions and we will see Madeline hopefully in just a minute. We have another question. Um, yes. So the question was, was that a new video? Um, it was actually filmed last summer. Um, during COVID, we had to be very aware of precautions. We we're very excited to have this video put together uh, and to have been able to work with our partners to create this video. Uh, and we're very excited to share it with you today. This is its first kind of official public screening. It is available on the Lang Pioneer Village YouTube channel if you'd like to to watch it again after this event is over. And we have another question. What are some experiences that you can have at Lang during an in-person tour? I'm so glad that you asked. We actually just opened yesterday for our first uh, seasonal summer tour day. Currently, we are not operating in our original Living History Museum model. Instead, we're doing guided tours, um, which I think gives you a really interesting perspective of the village. 
You'll get an hour long guided tour with one of our historical interpreters. They'll take you around be able to see all of our different historic buildings. Unfortunately, during current regulations, we're doing an outdoor only tour system. So you will be able to kind of peek inside the buildings, take a look around, um, but you'll be able to hear about them. We've added more elements regarding architecture to the tour this year while it's out of doors. We also have a few different interpreters working in buildings, doing more demonstrative tasks. Uh, and then Madeline is out at our Abnobin camp and she has an interpretation that visitors are able to, to see and connect with as well. Back closer to the center of the village. Can anybody see or hear me? We can hear you. Your photo is frozen a little bit. All right. Um, I'll just let that go as long as you can hear me. Uh, that's what's important. So what I was saying about the wigwam, I went over the structure a little bit and uh, the floor of it is cedar. And then um, I get people ask me about how many people would live in the wigwam. And usually it could be up to two families. And so these families would have been multi-generational families. So that means that you would have had grandkids, kids, parents, grandparents, all living in the wigwam together through all four seasons. And I was, I was starting to say back at the other location, the uh, Michisagig, would have navigated around their traditional territory rather than staying in one wigwam for the entire year. They would follow the food and they would follow the seasons. So as they moved around the territory, a new wigwam would be built for them there. Thank you very much, Madeline. That was an excellent answer. We very much appreciate it. Um, we have another question come in. What are the buildings and what is inside of it or them uh, another great question. We are super fortunate at Lang to have many buildings on site. Uh, we have four historic homes, three of which are currently set up as homes and are stops on our tour. Uh, these range from 1825 to around the 1860s. You saw them in the video as well. We also have several trades buildings. We have a print shop, a tinsmith shop, a blacksmith shop, and a weaver shop. Um, and then a hotel, which is from Keene, Ontario, right down the road from us, uh, a general store from Mini. We have a town hall, a church, uh, and a school, as well as some various agricultural barns, a cider barn, and a cheese barn. Uh, so those are kind of the things that you can explore when you visit. All of them are set up kind of in situ as if they were still living buildings that people were working in or living in and interacting with. I believe that we have time for a couple of more questions if anybody else has any. Um, are there any residential homes in the village? Um, would the person who was asking the question be able to clarify if they mean homes that people are still living in or um, just clarify what they mean by residential homes, please? Homes that the villagers used to live in, yes. So the Fife cabin, the Milburn house, and the Fitzpatrick house, all of which were seen in the video, as well as the Ayat cabin, which is currently set up to kind of show the history of lumbering in the Peterborough County area. Um, they were all houses that were lived in, and several of them houses that were lived in up until pretty pretty recently before they were moved here to our site. I'll note our grist mill, which is another building that we have here, is the only original building that is original to our site. Um, I'll also note, because sometimes people ask, nobody still lives on site. The houses are purely kind of set up for museum display at this point. Thank you very much for your question. Do we make flour? Uh, excellent question. Yes, we do. Uh, our grist mill is not running this summer, but we do make flour and I believe that we have flour for sale. Um, you can find more information about that on our website. We are, are very proud of our grist mill and all of the millers that we have on site from, from year to year. 
another question coming in. Do we have a favorite building? Uh, I will answer. Madeline can think about her answer and can share it when I'm finished. Um, mine is definitely the mini general store. It was built in 1858. We have it restored to 1899. If you come um, and you're on a tour with me or you see me around, I'll probably be there. I think it's got a lot of stories connected to it. It also just has a lot of really interesting artifacts inside, um, which gives it the win for me. Uh, Madeline, do you have a, a favorite building on site that you'd like to share? Um, it's a little bit windy, so let me know if you can still hear me. But I would say my favorite building is the schoolhouse, just because I remember coming to Lang and looking in the schoolhouse even before I started working at Lang. And it was definitely something that stood out to me. And I think it sticks with a lot of the kids that come to Lang because they can see in normal times they could sit in the school and look at the chalkboard and look at what if they what they would have been taught. And there's swings outside. And it really just is a connection to what I was experiencing experiencing as a kid and what any school kid could relate to. Excellent. That's one of my favorite like questions. <laughs> I'll give it another couple of minutes to see if we have any other questions come in through the chat. Um, thank you so much to all of you who have tuned in so far and uh, who have asked us questions. They've all been amazing. Okay, seeing no more questions for the moment. I believe that this kind of concludes our event for the day. I'd like to thank my co-host Madeline for sharing her time and her answers with us um, to the team who put together Abnovin as well. A big thank you. And to the National Trust for sharing their platform with us today. We are ever so grateful. I encourage you to check out the other launch day events happening this afternoon and this evening. You can find all the information on the National Trust sites and social media. Uh, and once again, I extend my thanks to you for joining. We hope that you stay safe. Enjoy the rest of Canada Historic Places Days and Launch Days. I'll pass it back over to Julia. Thank you so much for joining us, Lauren and Madeline. The video was very informative and we're really happy we could also have you for Historic Places Days. Um, so to everyone who managed to tune in, thank you for coming out. Have a great day.